Are we teaching the truth in love? Telling it like it is. Are we holding pure motives? Showing that we. So, if you read with, uh, with us this passage, we have a passage that talks mainly here about hope. You know, the three times it's mentioned hope. And maintaining that hope, uh, understanding that hope and maintaining that hope is vital to our daily life. Um, he even says that um, we have to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope. Now there's almost a contradiction here in the language. Because if you look at the English language itself, and you take that phrase, full assurance of hope, it's almost contradictory in the English language. The language of the Bible is a language in itself. I taught French, I also taught some Greek, at some point some Hebrew. The concepts are different. Even in French, espérance. It's a little different. You have to explain with the language, the, the way of thinking. So the Bible is a, we have to relearn sometimes the meaning of words. And it's very important, especially with the word hope. Let's say if someone says, a young person says, I hope someday I will marry somebody really nice and we'll have a good life together and we'll have children. That is not biblical hope. Or someone says, I hope someday I'll have a nicer house, you know, with bright colors and a yard and a garden. That's not biblical hope. Or somebody says, well, I hope maybe in two years, two or three years when I graduate, I'm going to have a really good job and I'm going to make good money. That is not biblical hope. So what is biblical hope? Here's the difference. Two people meet together, young girl, young man, they like each other, they get to know each other, and then, at some point, they plan a wedding. They do a lot of work, send out invitations, prepare, it costs money, all of that, and they have a date set for that wedding. That's the biblical hope. That means something has been planned, something is going to happen, and we're expecting it, and we're waiting for it with a lot of eagerness. Now, I know in some movies, you have all of that going on, and there's no wedding. <laughs> that happens sometimes, but that's exceptional. Or, if we want to take the other example of the house. It's not just, oh, I wish I would have a house someday, I could change my house, have a bigger house, nicer house. No. I went to the real estate, I have the money, in fact I paid in cash, and I got this house, I'm going to have it in about six months, we're going to be move in. It's going to be like this. That's the biblical hope. Or the other example of a job. Oh, maybe someday I'll have a better job when I graduate. No, no, you've been, uh, you've been uh, interviewed by somebody for a really good job, you sign the paper, and in six months you're going to go to get a job. That's the biblical hope. That's the difference. With wishful thinking and hope as it is defined in the English dictionary, and hope as it means in the Bible. And that's why if we read carefully some, something like Hebrews or any other text in the Bible, we'll see that what the hope he's talking about is a hope based on something that has been planned. And the plan has been beginning to take shape with real people in real historical situation. That's what he's talking about. Abraham was a real person whom God spoke to. He came out of a country and something happened to him which is connected to our hope. Some promise that God made to him said, you don't have any children? Well, you're going to have a lot of children. You're going to have a whole nation will come from you. And it happened. Not only that, but they will have a land. And it happened. It's something concrete. And from you will come one, not only who will bless you and your descendants, but one who will bless all the families of the earth. And that has happened. That's Jesus. And he died on the cross for that to happen. 
and then he rose from the dead for that to happen. So the hope we have is all planned out and we have signed into it because we are in the covenant and when you are in the covenant you have, you have signed into a covenant with God. You've been interviewed by God and he's assigned you to be his son or his daughter, to be part of his kingdom, to have an active part in his work. You're already involved into that, in that. So this is not just wishful thinking, the hope we're talking about here. This is the biblical hope that we're talking about. So that's why he's able to say, we desire each one of you to show the same in earnestness and to have the full assurance of hope until the end. How can I have full assurance of something I wish would happen? No, no. This is something that has been planned by God from a long time and has been realized step by step, stage by stage. Like a wedding I talked about. In fact, the imagery of the Bible is with the wedding. Because when Jesus comes back, it's going to be a big wedding. A marriage ceremony that we are preparing for when he returns. It's all been planned out. The invitations have been sent out. We responded to those invitations. He says, yeah, I want to be there. We have put on Christ in baptism. All these things are mentioned in Jesus' teachings as something that is ready, that is prepared. For example, he says, you've been invited to this big meal of the kingdom. It's not wishful thinking. He's invited you to the meal. And you've said yes to this meal. And you've come to this meal. You've joined all the others who are coming to this meal. If we understand hope the right way, which we should, and if we don't, we've got to go into the Bible and try and understand it better. If we understand hope that way, then he says, so that you may not be sluggish. It will help us to act in a better way. I'm convinced that our problem is not, as we might think, with faith. Our problem is with hope. We're really not certain what's going to happen there. We're not certain on what train we've embarked. You know, you go on the train and then suddenly, that has happened to me a few times in my life, I go on the train, you don't have trains here. You know, but you go on the train and then after about 15 minutes you look at the, you know, the landscape or half an hour you say, it doesn't look to be the right train and you got on the wrong train. So you got to go down and get another one. But you know where you're going when you get on the train. You know, it says you're going here, you're going there, so you're safe. You know where you're not. It's not just, I get on the train, any train, and it'll lead me anywhere I want. No. You're going on a train, and you know where you're going. All the events of the past that are mentioned in Hebrews or the Bible have actually happened are not just accidents. Oh, they just happened. Oh, it just happened that <laughs> the Israelites came out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses. It just happened that they took that land that was given to them. No, it was all part of a plan. And when Jesus is born in Bethlehem, and all that he does in his life, his miracles, the healing of the blind, that's prophesied in the Old Testament. The resurrection of the dead, that's prophesied in the Old Testament. Being crucified, that's already prophesied. All of that is part of a plan that God had. God had in mind, according to what I understand in the Bible, that he wanted, God wanted to live with us as a family. God is the father in the prodigal son story. And he's hoping and he's praying and he's waiting for the prodigal son to come back. That's what he wants. So God has planned everything so that we can live with him in pure joy, in pure happiness. I was asking the question this morning in the class, why is it that sometimes as human beings, we don't want to go all the way with God? I'd like to be holy, but not too much. I'd like to obey God, but don't ask me too much. What is it that prevents us from giving all of our life, all of our heart? What is it? I think we're not convinced that God 
because all that God has for us is good. Not one ounce of something God wants from us is bad. God has no evil intention for any of us. God wants us fully blessed, fully happy, fully at peace. From the beginning of the story in Genesis, the big problem with human beings, beginning with Adam and Eve, is did God really mean that? Did God really want you not to eat any of the trees? That's the lie. No. He said you can eat all of them. Just one you don't eat. So we, if we have a perspective of God as this mean guy that wants to hurt us, like the world is presenting us God sometimes, that which C.S. Lewis called God under judgment, he was right, very, pers very perspicuous uh, thinker. God under judgment, it's all the time. If you listen carefully to what you hear on TV or what you read or whatever. God under judgment, no. There are things about God I don't understand, but if I look at Jesus, who has revealed to us God fully in his love and his goodness, I understand, I understand now, that God's plan for me, God's plan for us, is good. It's a good plan. So if I understand that, here's what I think. Then he says, you will not be sluggish. We become lazy, we become passive, we stop doing what God wants us to do because really, we don't have hope. We're not expecting something to happen. That's for sure it's going to happen. When your wedding is prepared and you know it's going to happen, you're going to get it, get it done. You want it to happen. The same with these other examples that I gave. So, he says also in a second uh, passage about hope, we who have fled for refuge might have some strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Notice, this is not a hope that comes from me in my feelings. This is a hope that was set by God before me. This is a hope that is built by God. I didn't make it up. It doesn't come from my ideas, from my opinions, from my feelings. It's a hope that has been prepared by God. It's like a wedding I was talking about. God has been preparing it. It's this job that God is hiring me. It's been prepared by God. God has interview interviewed me. And I said yes to this job. I said yes, I want to be your son. I said yes, God, I don't want to live like I used to live. I, don't want, I want to go the full way with you. If I'm getting on this train, there's no way that I'm going to jump out. When it's running, you know, if I do, I might kill myself. So I'm going, I'm going to take the right train, and I'm going to stay on it, and I'm going to get at my destinations. So we have found refuge and a strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. Let's translate that other, other different way. We have to hold fast to this plan that has been prepared and that we expect to be realized. That's hope. You know, that's my long translation of that word. It's been prepared by God who doesn't lie, who doesn't make mistakes, created everything, and it's right, it's been set before me. I've entered into, we've entered into that hope, and it's going to happen at some point. That is certain. And then he says, the third time he mentions hope, verse 19, we have a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind our curtain. A hope. A plan that has been planned by God, that I'm expecting, and that God will bring about. It has nothing to do with my feelings, nothing to do with my opinions, with what's going on in the world around me. The hope of God does not depend on anything like that. Every other hope that we have depends on circumstances. Oh, what if this happens? I'm not going to. I'm not going to get married. What about this uh, job? Oh, if this happens, I'm not going to get this job. All these hopes that we have, human things, they can happen or not happen. Mm, maybe it will happen. Maybe not. Sometimes even weddings don't happen that we plan. Sometimes we sign a contract. We don't get the job. It happens. But with God, <laughs> it's going to happen. For sure. We have a hard time to give ourselves completely to what 
life God is calling us because I don't think we really believe sometimes that it's there and nothing can be changed about it. The plan of God is perfect and whether we obey it, whether we enter it or whether we don't enter it, the problem is it's going to happen anyway. Everything that God has planned for the future is going to happen. We cannot make it happen, but we cannot prevent it from happening. And this is where we have to understand that we have to make a, a decisive choice. When we commit to Christ, Jesus says that when you get your hands there on the, uh, when you're laboring the earth, and you're working on there, and if you turn back your eyes, already you have a problem. No, you go ahead and you work that, that work that you've done. Now he's telling them, he's warning them in Hebrews here because there is a lot of problems with these Christians. They're being persecuted. Some of their things are being, their houses are being taken because they're Christians. There's persecution coming up. And so he's telling them, well, what are you going to do now? There's difficulties. There's opposition. There's people making fun of you. So if somebody makes fun of me, because I follow Jesus? Or if somebody takes my job because I, you know, I follow Jesus? What am I going to do then? Is that going to change what God has planned? No. It's not going to change anything in what God has planned. Everything that people can do makes no difference in the fact that it's going to happen. This is the sort of assurance. It's a hope, he says, that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. Now, you notice how this hope, what I'm expecting, has nothing to do with my feelings at all. Whether I feel like this or like that makes no difference. He says it's a hope that enters behind the curtain. What is he talking about? It's a fact that when Jesus died on the cross, when he gave his life, as a sacrifice, that curtain was open. In fact, it was actually, at his death, literally open in the temple. It opened the curtain, and then the access to God was opened at that point. And that's something that no, nobody did. It's not a human being. It's not the high priest. It's not anybody. It's not me. It's just God did it. He opened the way. This is part of his plan. He opened the way so that we can now enter into the presence of God. So this is the choice we have to make. We have to enter into the presence of God or, or stay outside. And you cannot have one foot in the presence of God and one foot outside. You cannot get on the train and have one foot on the train and, and one foot there or on the airplane. You know, when you get on the airplane, they don't want you to have hard, half of your body, you know, <laughs> outside. It would be a little dangerous. Huh? You've got to get on the plane and you trust that you're going to get to your destination. So this is the hope that we have. The hope where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus entered for us into that presence. Jesus opened the way for us. He says, I'm the way, the truth and the life. We have a problem giving ourselves fully to what God wants us to do, I think because sometimes our hope is not well grounded. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Let's translate it differently. Faith is the assurance that whatever God has planned, has realized in history, for real, I expect it to happen. And every example he gives is like that. Whether it's Noah, whether it's Abraham or Sarah, whether it's the Israelite entering the promised land, they all knew this is something from God. It's not something from me or from the preacher or from a human being. This is something God has done himself. And all I have to do is to say yes to it. And once I have committed myself, I've entered into covenant with God, it's great. All I can expect is good from God. All I can expect is blessing. Does it mean I'm never going to be sick? I'm, never go <laughs> I'm not going to die? I'm never going to have financial problems? Yeah, there will be those things. 
But that's the whole point in Hebrews. The Hebrews, they're having a lot of difficulties. He says, don't give up. Look to the promises of God. Look to His Word. Look to the plan that He has for you. And then it will work out. One day, we'll be facing death. It makes no difference. God, in our suffering, in our physical pain, in leaving this life, will give us the strength, I believe, the assurance that what He has prepared for us, He will realize. God, who says in Hebrews twice, the God who cannot lie, who when He says He does something, He accomplishes it. And I think that's why He says in the beginning that He takes away the fear even of death, when it's like that. It's pretty amazing, actually, when you think about it. How we can be so sure, based on what God has told us, what God has accomplished in the Bible and through His Son, Jesus Christ. So whenever God asks us anything, whether it's to live a holy life, whether it's to believe, whether it's to be baptized, whether it's to take the Lord's Supper uh, regularly with other Christians, we should do it fully, full of heart and full of confidence, because that was planned by God. This is not an accident or somebody made this up. This was part of God's plan. Everything we do here on this Sunday, even when we give to the collection, it's not something the elders decided. Oh, we're going to give a collection on Sunday. No, this is part of God's plan. In the New Testament, it's when they came together to share in the bread and the wine that the Lord instructed them to give at that point. It's not an accident. It's not some kind of arbitrary decision that somebody made. It's part of what God instructed us to do. And everything we do is like that. We sing, God instructed us to do that. We pray, God instructed us. And in everything we do, it's because we have some instruction from God. It's part of God's plan, and we've entered that plan. We're part of that plan. We should never forget, then, that when we talk about hope, we're not talking the way of the world. We're talking